I know there's a quite a few brewers in the audience, and here's what I'd like you to do. You should think about the yeast you're using and why you're using it. I think for most of you, the answer will be, I don't know, it's the yeast we've been using forever, and many cases you don't even know where it came from, I think. And I guess that's sort of the, uh, the catch of the story. In many cases, the yeast that brewers are using to make a particular beer may not be the best yeast that you can use to make that beer. And I'm not so naive to think that you're all going to switch to a better yeast because obviously it's also going to change other parameters and you're happy. You've probably worked around the problems of your yeast using different fermenters and higher, lower temperatures and waiting an extra day in fermentation and whatever, centrifuging because it doesn't flocculate very well. But when you start making a new product or when you really upscale or whatever, you could be thinking about your yeast as well. And that's something that we in my lab think a lot about. So this is the lab. Um, it's a large group, 20 people or so. Uh, but about half of them do basic research. We use yeast as a model for human genetics and diseases. And that's something we'll hear, we'll hear a little bit about uh, later today. Uh, not from my lab so much, but from other researchers. Uh, and the other half um, works together with industry to try and make superior yeast. And one of the problems, of course, we have is um, we cannot tell or talk about some of the coolest things we're doing because it's contract research and no one likes their secrets to be spilled. But still I can give you an overview, a flavor of the kind of work we're doing and you'll have to believe me that apart from what I'm showing, we're doing more interesting things. So general aims, we're looking for yeast with an improved efficiency, meaning it's faster, you can get maybe more product out of the same uh, material, uh, maybe it can grow at lower temperatures or at higher temperatures. Um, and of course, we're also trying to improve quality, get better flavor, more diverse flavor, um, maybe higher stability of the product, those kinds of things. And, and preferably a combination of the two, ideally. And our general strategy is really not rocket science. Um, very simple, we are going to look what's out there in terms of yeast, and there's a lots of different yeasts that I'll show you. And that already helps you a lot, just picking the right yeast that's already out there. And then for specific applications or uh, specific breweries, specific projects, we may and try to create novel superior yeast. And the way we do this is just by breeding, simply like farmers have been doing for thousands of years by improving their crop and their livestock, we are doing the same with brewer's yeast. We're also using genetic modification, usually to learn more about the process, but this is not used to make yeast for brewers now. Although, and I do want to come back to a question that was asked to Jerome yesterday, I do actually, the lab definitely gets calls pretty much, I think I would say every month or so, Jan. Um, Usually from American brewers, small craft brewers that go like, oh, we read about you making GM yeast and we would really like to try it. And it makes a lot of sense. We never give it to them because we're not confident they would sort of do all the paperwork to get it approved. But it makes sense for these smaller breweries to, to start trying and, and in principle we would be interested to, to help them. Because of course, they may lose a lot of people who are against GM, but they may also gain a lot of customers that want to try it because it is a GM, a GM yeast. And so we do see a shift in, in that behavior definitely amongst the craft brewers in the US. We, we regularly get questions. But so for now, we do not uh, produce GM yeast for commercial production in brewing. We do do it for biofuel. <coughs> All right, so quickly what I'm going to talk about, natural diversity, then a, little, a few examples of how we can make superior hybrids or novel yeast. Um, a new project we're working on to increase the screening potential that we have, because that's a huge bottleneck, and if we have time left, probably not, but Bart is a friend of mine. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about why uh, beer tastes so good in the first place. It's a cool story. So we, we have this large uh, historical and, and also new collection of, of yeasts at, at, um, at my lab. Over a thousand industrial yeasts and in total we're at like 20 or 30,000 different yeasts. And just to give you an idea of how diverse these yeasts are, these are just uh, a few hundred of the industrial yeasts um, from different industries, and we measured their isoamyl acetate production in small-scale wort fermentations, and there's a 34-fold range in, in these conditions here. 
34 fold. That's quite exceptional, right? I want you to think about humans. Take body length, take IQ, you hardly find 34 fold range, especially not if you're not looking at really outliers, mutants. Uh, this is quite continuous, so we're not looking at the weirdos, you know, the one off mutant that is sort of a dwarf or, or a giant. This is quite continuous, and you have a 34 fold range. It's, it's really exceptional. And this is true for many of the phenotypes that we've measured. And we measured a lot of different phenotypes. We measured all the aroma productions of these uh, yeast. We measured their stress resistance, how well they do in beer fermentations, uh, biofuel fermentations, uh, different temperatures, whatever you can think of. And this is just a small view of the data. I'll show you a little bit what it looks like. But uh, zooming in on a few of these, these are uh, different flavor compounds. And one of the cool things you can do is you can correlate them. Um, and apart from lots of pretty graphs, uh, it tells you, for example, that ethyl acetate and isoamyl acetate are correlated. It's something we kind of knew, but of course now we have this large data set, so um, it gives us a better view on things. But this also helps us in breeding. If a brewer comes to us and says, we want zero ethyl acetate, but extremely high isoamyl acetate, we're going to have to say, sorry. We can look for outliers, you know, there, there are some, some yeasts that are off axis. But clearly, they're quite correlated. So getting one extremely high, another one extremely low just by breeding will be difficult. So those are the things we learn about this. Um, you can also look at stress tolerance. And um, you can see that our data set makes sense if you compare two different measures of osmotic stress tolerance. Uh, you can see that they're highly correlated. Uh, one cool correlation that is maybe less obvious is temperature resistance and ethanol resistance. They are correlated, which was also described in literature before. But again, we have now a, a huge data set to confirm this. Another way to look at the data is to split it up according to the, the, the yeast and their, their industrial origins, if you will. And you do see that, that people have been selecting. So when I was telling you earlier that you've just been using random yeast, that's of course not entirely true. Um, for example, uh, ethanol uh, growth at 12%, so relatively high, our ale yeast, so this here is the median, our ale yeasts are wimps. Uh, and our lager yeasts are even worse. They're not on the on the picture here. And of course, for for wine and sake yeast, they're clearly selected to do better, and they need to go up to 12, right? Our ale yeast, many of our ale yeast, uh, don't need to go that high. And the biofuel yeast, clearly, there has been selection. Although, again, there's some wild yeast even that seem to top what's being used in industry, and some of the ale yeast, for example, do really well. And you can also look at copper resistance. It's typical. Um, typically a phenotype that's been selected for in, in wine yeasts uh, and you can, you can see that effect here as well um, because it's used to, uh, to fight diseases in vineyards. I'm not going to go into this but I want to sort of warm you up for a, for a talk that will come just after the next coffee break. Um, my lab together with White Labs has been also sequencing the full genomes of 200 beer yeasts, uh, both lager and ales, but mostly ales. And one of the cool things, and I'm sorry for the spoiler, guys, um, is that we found that there's two huge super families of ale yeasts. That's something that we didn't know before. So you have A1 and A2, two brewing clades. Uh, and A2 was, was known before at Louis found this. Um, so this is the, you didn't have so many brewing yeast in, in your set. And they mostly sort of go together with the wine yeast, but they're still clearly separated, which is, you know, historically kind of interesting. But then we found this huge clade that is quite separated from two. So it looks like there were two domestication events, two events where people first started to use yeast, and then it seems like those yeast evolved further in breweries. And so all the yeast that were, or most of the yeast that we're using in our breweries, they're kind of related to each other. Um, but Brigida and Truls are going to tell you much more about this. So this is a view on the data set as we have it uh, in a heat map. So every column is a different measure of the yeast. It could be a specific aroma, a stress resistance. And every horizontal line is a different yeast. And so this here is the family tree. So you can um, cluster them according to their, their genetic relatedness, or brothers and sisters are closer, if you will, than nephews and nieces. And then you can, do, you can see that there is something about this clustering. You know, there's some families that, for example, do quite well here. This means high red, and blue means low. So you do see this genetic effect, but you 
also see just how diverse these yeasts are. And this is the first um, data set we have in the lab, and so when people come to us, and this happens quite regularly, we want to make a beer this and this way, we usually present a few different yeasts, they can try them, if they like them, they have to pay them. Um, and then that yeast um, is for their exclusive use. So we've also been trying to make superior yeast, and to do that, uh, I first had the strategy to have lots of uh, master thesis students. Um, then I found that a robot does more work and complains much less. Um, so we still have lots of cool uh, thesis students. But the robot really helped us a lot, so it's a robot that can uh, take 96 yeast, or actually 384 yeast, if you will, um, at one time, and then cross them, put them on plates. Um, and this really helps us to increase the throughput. Because when you want to do breeding, it can be a slow and tedious process, even with yeast. And this robot really makes it go much quicker. The scale of things really improves. And that's important for brewing, because there might only be one or two yeast in a, in a few thousand um, that are really better. And again, so this is this 30-fold for a uh, 34-fold range in isoamyl acetate. You can pick a few of the top strains and start breeding them, and and then look at how their offspring is doing. And I'm not showing you all the data, so this is just a bit selected. The, the parents are always the color dots, so we put the best parent at one. And you can see that some of the offspring actually goes considerably above the best parents and up to a 50 uh, 50 percent increase in in isoamyl acetate. And we already were quite high, and some of these yeasts are now used in production, so that's one of the things I can talk about. Um, so one of, these, one of these top producing yeast has been used now in a Canadian brewery who were interested in making a relatively low alcohol, 6% alcohol beer that would still have a very fruity character. They wanted to resemble it some of the Belgian triples. And so we presented this yeast, well, amongst a few others, and they selected this one. We've also been working on biofuel. Um, these are two of the uh, most used biofuel strains and some of the hybrids we made. But this was a four-year project of thousands and thousands of hybrids. But some of the hybrids that we made, at least in the lab, do considerably better than um, these strains that are used in industry. So there are possibilities there. You can do even cooler things. Normally with breeding, you're limited to the species barrier, so you would only breed Saccharomyces cerevisiae with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but as you all know, our lager yeast is a hybrid between two different species. And there's other examples in nature. When my students first showed me these pictures, I thought they were trying to pull my leg. I thought this was Photoshop. But after uh, doing a bit of Google searching myself, I had to admit that these animals are real. So sometimes species barriers are crossed. Um, and they look considerably cooler than this one, but this one makes better beer. So I don't know if you followed the literature, but much like the lager yeasts, uh, sorry, much like the ale yeast, where Trulls and Bridget are going to talk about, also the lager yeast have two superfamilies. It looks like there were two of these hybridization events um, that constructed or that, that, that uh, <coughs> yielded two different superfamilies of lager yeast. And we figured, well, maybe we can do this in the lab as well and we can make more superfamilies of, of lager yeast. And that's what Stan has been working on. Uh, one of the main organizers, you've seen them all. So that's what he's doing when he's not organizing a beer conference. He's making, uh, he's crossing different yeast species to try and find some that can make beer. And so in green are a few of the lager yeasts of one uh, superfamily, namely the Saas type Pastorianus. In red are the Frobergs. And this is just a principal component analysis of their aroma profiles. And in blue are some of the hybrids that Stan made. So you can already see that aroma-wise, they're definitely filling a whole new spectrum of aromas. Um, one thing we found is that many of these new hybrids don't ferment particularly well. But some of them actually do, and some of them were actually better than any of the yeast that we had in our collection, uh, than any of the lager yeast. So that's a, a cool project, and it's, it's ongoing, and we, we like to carry it further. Um, but it already tells you that there is some potential there as well in the lager yeast. Another way to improve yeast is not by sexual breeding, but by, I would say, asexual Darwinian evolution. It's called uh, directed evolution or experimental evolution. So what you see here are six continuous reactors. So you cannot see the reactors. They're behind these 
bottles and wires here. And they've been going for five years now. And so we have a continuous inflow of medium and a continuous outflow of medium. So they're really continuous reactors. And if you're wondering if we ever got contamination, the answer is no, because what we're selecting for is improved ethanol tolerance. And so we're now at 12, 13% ethanol in these reactors and the yeast are still growing. There's a big difference between surviving and growing. So they survive maybe at 18 or 20%, but they're growing still at 12 and 13%. So we, we hardly get infections anymore in, in, uh, in these devices. And so every two weeks or so we take a sample and we sequence the complete genome of some of the yeast that we have in these fermenters. Um, and the first thing you notice though is that their ethanol tolerance is going up. I mean, we started with a pretty wimpy strain that was sort of tolerant to seven, eight percent. And like I said, we're now at 12 and a half, 13 percent. Um, and you can also measure this in the lab. This is generation, so it's not uh, time in years or so, but this is about two years because they're growing extremely slow. 200 generations, and you can see that the growth speed in 9% alcohol has increased compared to the parent. But if you would go higher to 10, 11, 12%, the difference becomes infinite because the, the parent just dies. It cannot grow at those percentages. So we've been sequencing the genomes. There's no time to go into the details. It's, uh, it's one of the longest papers that we're putting out. Karen has been working on this. I think it's going to be, what, like 20, 30 pages or so? 64 pages, okay. Uh, it should come out in plus uh, genetics at some point. Uh, we're in the last stages. So we, we sequenced uh, hundreds and hundreds of isolates um, and identified the mutations and, and sort of saw how the mutations go. And you can get these cool diagrams. These are simplified uh, reproductions of what is going on in these reactors. So this is time point zero. You can see around the, what is it, 20th generation or so, a mutation shows up and it sort of starts penetrating the population. But then a better mutation shows up and it quickly takes over the population because the cells are so much better. And then the next mutation happens within this background and the next one and the next one, so they get better and better. And then this green one comes and sort of takes over. Um, and this keeps carrying on and some of the fermenters, it's way more complex than this. And this is only a small, in total we have hundreds of mutations that are flowing around. Um, but these are sort of the most important ones and we, we took nine of those that we figured that are really, that we predicted to be driving the ethanol tolerance. Um, and we, six of those we validated to really improve the ethanol tolerance, uh, not only in a lab strain, but also in a biofuel strain. And we've now patented these. I sort of could have, instead of ABC, I could have actually given you the names because the patent was filed, I think, last week. Um, so that's another way to look at these. Um, there's no genetic modification involved here. By identifying these mutations, you could maybe try with breeding, for example, um, to, to get better biofuel strains. And that's, of course, one of the things we're hoping to do with this. All right, then lap on chip approaches. One of the bottlenecks that we're experiencing with our yeast breeding is you can only test so many strains, right? These students can only work, well, 25, 25 hours in one day, which means you can, do, you can test 100 yeast, maybe 200 yeast. 500 if you really push it in small fermenters, but that's sort of the limit. And we generate thousands and thousands of yeast with our little robot. So we've been looking at solutions to, to scale things down. And one of the things we came up with is to try and work in microchips. And these are microfluidic chips. So there's no electricity going through these chips, but there's fluids going through them. And so this is two by two centimeter. I actually brought one. Eh, let's see if I can find it. So there's a chip in here, well, the dimensions are on there, but it's cooler to see it, right? So this is one of those chips, very small. And so we have fluids going through here, and we're working together with iMac, which is this huge uh, chip factory right next to my lab, so we're kind of lucky uh, that they were there. Um, and they're making computer chips, but also now venturing into life sciences. And this is how it looks like uh, when you look at it under the microscope as the chip is going. So you can, you can see um, droplets being formed. And droplets are actually aqueous solution. And surrounding the droplets is oil. So you have water droplets in oil. And you can see that we can generate them at a fairly high rate. You, later the image will skip and you'll see them being generated so that it's 
well, it sounds very simple. You just inject small volumes, pulsed volumes of, of an aqueous solution into the oil here, and then you just make these droplets. Um, so that is quite well established, and we can have this mini fermenter here. We can stop the flow and incubate these droplets, or we can catch these droplets into a bigger tube. They're quite stable. Um, and more importantly, and that's what Yannick in my lab has been uh, working on, we can now put yeast cells in them. And we can make these droplets not just of water, but we can make them out of words, even high gravity words. And so Yannick, with the help of an InBev by Latour grant, uh, is trying to really optimize this technology for um, screening yeast. So we can put one yeast cell in, in these droplets, and if you look carefully, you actually see these, these dots here are the yeast cells. So they're growing in there. We see them growing. We can incubate them for a week, but we're not there yet. So in all fairness, uh, one of the things we're struggling with is we have to measure the alcohol that they're producing, or the aromas, or whatever we're interested in. So that's still uh, a problem, although I'll show you in the next slide that you know we have ideas for this. And the other problem that in the beginning we had is that as the yeast is producing CO2, these bubbles tend to get bigger. And at first we thought, oh, that's a cool way to see their fermentation rate. But then the bubble literally bursts. Uh, so then the fun is over. But that's something we worked, or that Yannick actually solved, by uh, finding different oils that let the CO2 out. So we're now in a position where we can ferment for more than a week, I think. Where is Yannick? There you are. More than a week? Good. OK. So this is uh, the solution we have in mind to try and assay these. At the end of fermentation, we could have one of these droplets come here and then maybe fuse it with a droplet that has some reagent, for example, fluorescent reagents to, to measure alcohol or anything we're interested in, and then send them to a fluorescent cell sorter to measure it and see if, if and which ones of these yeasts are doing better than others. So we're really trying to improve the screening possibilities here. This is also a cool uh, project in the lab where we're looking at the lag phase. As you know, brewing yeast likes glucose much more than maltose. And brewers have the opposite uh, in the sense that they like to feed the maltose much more than glucose. So when yeast transit from glucose to maltose, there's a lag phase. They uh, stop growing, they stop fermenting for a while as they are activating their maltose genes. And that's what you see here. They're growing on glucose under the microscope. And now they're switching to maltose and they stop growing. And then you see that, because we marked them fluorescently, some of these cells switch to maltose quite rapidly and others take a much longer time, although they're genetically all the same. And so that's another phenomenon that we're trying to unravel. Uh, what makes yeast switch faster to maltose and can we find mutants that actually do this quicker? And we already found mutants that do it much quicker that actually will eat the maltose together with the glucose. How many minutes? Almost finished. So that probably means I'm already over time. Huh? <laughs> Very quickly then, I'll sacrifice questions. Why does beer taste so good? Have you ever wondered why yeast cells make flavors in the first place? Something that kept me busy for my PhD. Um, I was working on yeast flavors, and I always wondered, but why does yeast make them? And I don't know if you know this, so yes, you, you definitely know all these fruity flavors, yeast-derived fruity flavors. But I don't know if you know that yeast actually has a specific gene, ATF1, so a specific piece of DNA that makes a specific enzyme to make these flavors. And why do they do this? Is this to please the brewers and the winemakers? Maybe, but probably they have different reasons. And then, and this really happens, so when I tell this to journalists, um, they never believe it, so I send them this picture because I was smart enough to take the picture. This was during my PhD. On a Friday night, I was eager to get to the pub, and uh, so I left the lab a bit quickly, and I left an, a, a yeast strain that overexpressed this enzyme that produces 100-fold more of the fruity flavors, and then a wild type, just a normal yeast, and then one where I, delete, where I deleted the flavor gene. And there was a fruit fry lab just next door, and when I returned on Monday, this was the result, so that was sort of a, hmm, <laughs> aha moment, and I remember he also pointed this out, like, ah, the yeast is just attracting the fruit flies. And so finally, just uh, two years ago or so, Joaquin started working on this project and it's just finished, it's just published now, where we work together with neurobiologists. Many neurobiologists work with fruit flies because they're a great model to look at brain activity and, and urinal responses. So they have these behavioral assays where they can flow air from four different corners of a of um, a cage, if you will, and you can see which corner the, the flies prefer. And this is what happens when you 
uh, just flow air from the four corners. And then at some point uh, in this movie, I don't know if you saw it, we started flowing air from a normal yeast well, that was bubbled through the fermentation medium or beer made with a normal yeast and air that was bubbled through beer that was made with, um, let me see if I can play it again, that was made with a yeast that does not have the flavor gene. So this is air still, air, 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 and now this is the flavor of the normal beer and this is flavor of a beer made with a, a mutant yeast that does not produce the aromas. And you can see that the, the, the flies really go to that corner and also still to the, to the corners of the airflow. Uh, you can quantify this, you can do this with lots of different yeast and different flies and whatever, but this you can see that you know if you um, if you delete the flavor gene, the yeast don't go to this corner, they don't prefer it over even air, and then the, the normal beer is usually preferred. You can start adding flavors back, uh, ethyl acetate, isoamyl acetate, and you can restore the response of the flies to the uh, to the beer, really showing that it's these flavors that are attracting the flies. And these neurobiologists, they're quite cool, they always take it a step further, so you can actually put a fly, a live fly, under the microscope, slice open the skull, and the fly is genetically modified so that when the brain triggers, uh, when you have a neuronal impulse, you get a fluorescent uh, flash, and you can register this under the microscope, it looks a bit like this, and you can make brain images of these fly brains. Uh, you have a good pair of steady hands for that. Uh, and you can see the response to a normal beer, so, I imagine our response much must look quite similar, sort of red flashes in the brain, like beer, beer. This is the response to a very flavorless beer, I would say. And then if you add the esters back, you can restore the response. So it's quite cool. Um, these yeasts are really trying to attract flies, and why? Because these are fluorescent yeast cells on the not so sexy leg of a fly. The flies do carry those yeast to the places they want to go. So we, for a long time, we thought that yeast was flowing around in the air. It's actually very hard to catch yeast in the air, um, but you can catch it from insects. And it looks like it's not just a coincidence. The yeast is actively trying to recruit flies to uh, take them somewhere. And we actually tested this as well. It's competing mutant yeast that produce more or less aromas, and you can see that the ones that produce more aromas get more taxi service from the flies than the ones that don't. So this is the, the yeast view of, uh, of insects. All right, much of this has been published. Um, and last but not least, I thank Bart for letting me go over at least five minutes. And of course, I have to thank all my students because they do all the hard work. And especially, of course, today, uh, it's been said enough and we'll probably say it at the end of the conference, but Stan and Gino for organizing this conference. Thanks. I'm sorry I'm in the back, but I have one short question. So if you have a new yeast with a, a higher ethanol tolerance, with many difference in number of nucleotides, this corresponds, or in percentage of difference of the genome? Oh, it can be very small. So some, some of the mutations we identified is just one letter, one difference uh, in the code. But of course, those are incremental changes. They're small changes. So mm -hmm. combining those makes the effect bigger. But in total, we're talking about, I think, in our fermenters, so the ones that go from, say, 7 8% to 12%, we're talking about, I would say, no more than 20 or so changes that matter. So 20 nucleotides in uh, 13 to the 6th, I guess. Yeah. And uh, with many different proteins, it corresponds? Uh, so, in most cases, it's then 20 different proteins. So, yes, they are, well, not all of the mutations are within coding regions. So, sometimes it can also be regulatory changes. So, one protein might be high, more highly expressed uh, after a mutation. Um, but, yeah, in general, they're spread around. So, it's usually, you know, 20 different, uh, 20 different genes or proteins. Okay, thank you.